Okay, so I'd like to wait, welcome everybody along. Thank you very much for coming along to this webinar, Editing Your Holiday Snaps with Photoshop CC. My name is Gavin Hoey, and I'm going to be your presenter for the next 45 minutes or thereabouts. I'd like to thank Adobe UK for making this possible. Without them, none of this would actually happen, and I'd just be sitting at home on a Thursday evening uh, watching telly, no doubt. So uh, I'm really pleased that Adobe have invited me along to come and do this webinar. So what am I going to do for the next 45 minutes? Well, I'm going to take you on some of my holidays this year. Now, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to sound like I go on holiday a lot, because that's not quite the case. I, I rarely get to go on holiday, but I've been on about four. And by holiday, I'm using the loose definition. That's going to include uh, working holidays, uh, weekends away, as well as my one and only holiday that I might have had um, earlier this year. Now, what I find with holidays is that's the time when you tend to take most of your pictures, unless you're a full-time professional, in which case, hopefully, you're busy all year round. But for my personal work, the holiday season is when I'm out taking most of my shots. That's the time I go out with my camera, I'm in new and exciting surroundings, and I get stimulated to go and shoot more photography. So we're going to edit a few of these shots, and I'm going to show you a few of my favorite new features inside of Photoshop CC as we go along, and a few of my classics as well. So let's close this down, and we're going to go right back to the beginning of the year, my very, very first holiday this year. Again, holiday in inverted commas. First place I went to was New York. So I went to New York in February. It was a working holiday, let's put it that way. Uh, I was out there shooting some videos for Adorama TV, and I had a couple of spare days. Now, I've never been to New York before. I was determined not to like it, because I'm, I'm not really a city person. I don't, don't do crowds. I absolutely loved it. I loved the place. It was amazing. It was awesome use a popular phrase out there. It really was astonishing. Now, when I go on holiday, pretty much the first photograph I take of almost all of my holidays is the view from the hotel window. And that's what you see here. Now, I booked this hotel knowing that it had a great view. Unfortunately, the great view was on the other side of the hotel, and my room was the less interesting side of the hotel. But nonetheless, this is a view of downtown New York and a convention center. But the colors of New York, absolutely stunning. Now, I've already played around a little bit with the raw files to uh, tweak the color. And we're going to talk about uh, tweaking colors as in some of the future um, uh, edits that I do. So I'm not going to go through that. But what I am going to deal with is one of the most common problems as a photographer we get with wide angle lenses. You can see that the, the verticals are diverging or converging, depending how you want to view it. And the Hudson River, I don't know if you can see, but that's the Hudson River flowing across there. I don't remember it flowing up or downhill. I'm not sure if it's uphill or downhill. I never found out which way it went. But it definitely isn't that angle. So I've got some adjustments to do here. Now, normally, I would do this inside of Photoshop. But I shoot pretty much everything in RAW. I am RAW to the core. So I like to do things in RAW where I can. And nowadays, I can do just that. I can jump over to the Lens Corrections here. Now, there are three tabs on Lens Corrections. And I should say, if you're a, I'm using Photoshop CC, but if you're a Lightroom worker, then that, this is in Lightroom too, of course. So there are three tabs that I can play with here. There is the Profile tab. And if I turn that on, that'll allow me to automatically correct for any lens distortion and lens vignetting that my lens has. And Photoshop is great, because it, it, it works out what lens I've got from the camera EXIF information. And just it just applies the setting. You just turn it on. Thing is. I actually like it turned off. I actually like the slight distortion and the slight vignetting I get with most of my lenses. So I'm going to leave that off. Next one along is the color tab. Now, this is one that should be turned on by default. I can't believe this isn't turned on by default. Remove chromatic aberration. Now, chromatic aberration is something that you sometimes see where you have highlights and shadows, and they kind of meet. And sometimes you'll get a magenta or a green fringing where the two meet. Now, I've not yet met a photographer who wants more chromatic aberration. I think most of us would like less or none. And if you tick that box, that's what you get, less or none. So I always tick that box. The only time I don't tick it is when I forget to go and do it. 
Next one is the menu option, and the chances are the menu option is the one of these three that you're not going to use, and it's a shame because it's probably the most powerful. Manual, you see, manual sounds like hard work, doesn't it? And I, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of hard work, but there is some automatic tools in here that will magically transform this picture. There is one here that is a no entry sign, that means it's switched off. There is an A for automatic, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And then there is this one here, the middle one of the three, which will allow me, if I click on it, to automatically straighten up my horizontals. Okay, so in this case, the horizon line that was a bit wonky is now nice and straight. And it was a bit wonky because I had jet lag. That's my excuse, and I'm, I'll argue it until the end of this webinar. The next one is the same thing, but on verticals. Now, if you look pretty close on that right-hand side, you'll see that the the line of the, the flats, the individual windows, isn't perfectly straight. It's slightly wonky because I've angled my camera. But if I click on the, the next button along, it'll try and straighten things up. Now, it's not going to be absolutely perfect, but it's pretty darn close. And for me, that's that's close enough. What about the last one? Ah, now, the last one tries to do it so that both your horizontals and your verticals are straight. Brace yourself for this one, because this can be an interesting and unexpected effect, because this is going to be a computer version of straight and horizontal. Ready? Here it comes. Yeah, OK, so sometimes you get that. That's fine. That's why there's various options available to you. But most of the time, the option I choose is the A, automatic. It tries to balance out the three and give you a nice, easy average. And frankly, nine times out of 10, that straightens up and levels and does everything that I want just fine. Now, if you want to, you can always go and take manual control. And I could just straighten up my, my edges a little bit, I guess. But um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of happy with it the way it is with the automatic. But those tools are there to be used. Don't overlook them, because if you're using a wide angle lens, that particular part of RAW is super useful. OK, so let's go do something completely different. And we're going to stick in New York as we move around on my first little break. Uh, I went to somewhere, well, the Brooklyn Bridge. I wanted to go here, but I didn't realize how enormous it was. I mean, Brooklyn Bridge is massive, absolutely enormous. And we went for a little bit of a walk along the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, I had my digital SLR with me, but when you're on a holiday, you don't always want to carry around a great big digital SLR camera. Sometimes what you want to do is you want to take your small phone. And this is taken with my mobile phone. In fact, I can show you. If I go to File, I go to File Info. On File Info, it'll actually tell you what phone I'm using. It's a Samsung a GTN 7100. That's code for a Note 2, Galaxy Note 2. And it's a good little camera. It's not amazing, but it's good enough. So I shot a lot of pictures with my mobile phone. Trouble with shooting with your mobile phone is we don't tend to do very much with them as far as post-processing goes. I mean, if you want to do some serious post-processing on your phone or your tablet, something like Photoshop Touch is well up to the job. But if I want to really process this, I want to do it inside of Photoshop. So let's do that now. Let's just do a little bit of processing to improve the shot. The quickest way you can improve the picture is cropping. And not just this one, pretty much every picture. As photographers, we try and capture wide scenes, but sometimes the scene we want is just a little bit more tight. We want to go in closer. I've also got it a bit wonky, so let's start by getting the straighten tool. And I'll drag a nice little straight line across there so it straightens up the bridge. And with the same crop tool, I can just come and just crop off the bottom like that. And what I end up with is a, a much more kind of letterbox format. Now that, straight away, is better, I think. I think it's a bit more dramatic. It, it kind of just works as a, a more interesting picture. The bit at the bottom wasn't required. But if I'm absolutely honest with you, what I really want to do with my mobile phone pictures is I want RAW. I love RAW. I do everything that I can in RAW. My mobile phone only shoots JPEG. Yeah, I know it's an Android, and I could root it and get RAW, but I couldn't bring it into Adobe Camera RAW. But I can with a JPEG. Now, if you wanted to do this previously, you'd go via bridge, maybe, or there was a sort of a secret little workaround on file and open as. But one of my favorite new features is under the filter menu. Because now I can jump into filter, and I can use camera raw as a filter. 
Yep, Camera Raw as a filter, exactly the same as Camera Raw normally, with one exception, there's no cropping, which is why I did the cropping. But I can use all of the tools here in Raw. Now let's be clear, this is still a JPEG image, so even though I'm in Adobe Camera Raw, I can't do those amazing things that I could with a pure Raw file. I can't pull back all the detail from the, the highlights, for example. But I can do kind of basic stuff. I can come in here and I can fix the white balance, so maybe just a little bit warmer on the white balance like that. Um, if I come down to the highlights, maybe we'll just try and recover the highlights a bit, and we'll open up the shadows a little bit, and maybe I'll put a bit of clarity in. How long have I gone? I've gone nearly 10 minutes and I haven't mentioned clarity. That's, that's, that's a record for me, I think. I do like my clarity. So we'll put a bit of clarity in there as well. And that just gives it a nice feeling and a, a, a better kind of edge and yeah, I mean, it's getting there. But I think, I really think this should be a black and white. This picture says black and white to me. We've got blues, we've got reds, we've got yellows. There's a nice range of tones in here to get a good black and white. Now, I do my black and white work inside of Adobe Camera Raw. So again, in Lightroom, it could be Lightroom, or it could be in Photoshop. Either way, I'm going to the HSL stroke grayscale option. Now here, there is a button that says convert to grayscale. Clicking on convert to grayscale will take my picture down just to a black and white image. And you know, that, that's fine, but we can do so much better than that. Now I can do better by moving these individual sliders around. Now the reason I like to do it here in RAW is I've got oranges and purples that I don't get inside of Photoshop. So I've got a little bit more control. But the thing I want to change first is the sky. What color is the sky? Yeah, it's blue. We all know the sky is blue. But as I move my blue slider down, have a look at that sky. And you'll see it starts to kind of break up into a not a smooth gradient anymore. That's kind of the downside of using JPEGs, particularly on a, a phone where they're heavily compressed it's going to show the limitations quite quickly. So I have to be a little bit more gentle than maybe I would with a raw file. But if you keep that in mind, that's OK. The oranges of the bridge, I can go and grab my orange slider and make the, the bridge and the, the, kind of the, the stonework a little bit brighter. And maybe we'll make the reds of his, uh, the guy in front here. He's got these lovely warm clothes on. I have to say, it was at minus 10. It was freezing. And being a, a true Brit, I went out there with just a lightweight fleece. <laughs> I didn't realize how cold it would be. It was incredibly cold. Uh, so we can put a nice deep red and, and get that heavy black. So now we're getting a nice kind of moody black and white. But I want to work on that sky a bit more. I want a bit more drama in the sky. Well, although this is a JPEG, and although I'm using the, the Camera Raw filter, I've got all of the toys that Camera Raw gives me normally. So I've got things like the graduated filter. And with the graduated filter, I can say, OK, well, let's just have, I don't know, stop and a half of less light up on the sky. OK, so I can just darken that sky down and maybe a little bit less light down on the footpath as well. Sorry, it's not footpath, is it? Sidewalk or... I had to try and learn the lingo. I didn't do very well. I, got, I became much more British over there. I don't know why. Uh, I'm going to get the, uh, the adjustment brush. And with the adjustment brush, I'll just increase the exposure by a stop and just put a stop of light on his face, just so we can see underneath his lovely warm hood. Um, if you're going out to New York in February, that's how you want to dress. Trust me. So that's pretty good. Now, one of the new features that snuck under the radar in RAW in Photoshop CC in the newer versions is right down the bottom here. Basically, what I think has happened is the Adobe engineers have raided Lightroom's store cupboard and nicked some of the great features. Hooray, good for them. For example, I can now have a cycle through before and after views. So now by clicking the little Y button, I can go through various different ways of seeing my image before and after. And that's fantastic. I've wanted that for so long. And we can just keep going through until we go back to the beginning. There's a button, the next one along, that automatically switches off everything and takes you right back to the before or the after. That's kind of handy. The one right on the right hand side, and it's right at the end, if I click on that one, it'll only switch off the active panel. So at the moment I'm on the HSL grayscale tab, so if I click on that one, it'll switch that off and switch it back on again. That leaves us one more. What does this little arrow that points to the left do? 
Well, what that does is it sets a brand new before point. Okay, so normally when you're looking at a before and after, the before is how you brought the picture into RAW. But if I click on this button now, the before is now. Okay, so this is a before point. If I go and do something kind of fun, let's jump to one of my presets and I'll go for the uh, vintage effect I, I made for tipsgrill.com a while ago. Uh, so that applies a nice little a vintage effect. And now if I want to have a look at my before and after, my before will be that black and white. So I can have a look at different before states and I can judge it and if I decide I'm going in the right place I can make another before state and that really makes life a little bit easier as you're making the decisions on how you want to edit your shot. Okay, let's come out of that. We've got one more to do of New York before we, we leave New York and head somewhere else. And it's this one right here. Okay, so now I did a little bit of research before I went to New York but you know, part of the fun of going somewhere new on holiday is exploring. Now I was in New York all on my own, nobody with me, no family, nothing, uh, and I, I had a rough idea of a few places I wanted to get to. And to get to them I thought the best way to go would be to walk on foot around New York. I mean New York is a lovely place, it's nice and easy to, to work out where you're going, it's in a nice grid system, so it, it's almost impossible to get lost. But that meant I found a few things I wasn't expecting. Now I was heading towards this building here, this is the Flatiron building, and I, I knew I wanted to go there, I knew that's, that's the place I wanted to be, but what I wasn't expecting was the clock. I hadn't seen it on any pictures or seen anybody photograph it, I'm sure it's been photographed a million times, but it has been photographed a million times. When I found it I thought, I know what I want to do, I want to give the impression of time. I mean I know it's not Times Square, but I wanted time to be moving. The picture I had in my head was a long exposure with the clouds flying by and streaking and maybe the hands of the clock moving just to give the feeling of time. Now I, I had a tripod with me but it was back in the hotel and even if I had to set it up there is no chance of getting that shot. The place was heaving. What you can't see below the bottom is just the entire of New York walking around around me. If I put a tripod down it would be kicked every couple of seconds it was, it was not, not even a, a good idea. So I'm going to have to do it here inside of Photoshop. So let's give it a whirl. Let's see if we can make time fly. First thing I'm going to do is make the hands of this clock look like they're turning. And I'm going to make a copy layer before I go too far, because I'll forget if I keep talking. Layer and duplicate layer. Click OK. So we've got an exact copy, and I'll explain why in a second. Now I'm going to make the hands spin. Now there are plenty of ways you could do this. I'm going to use Filter, Blur Gallery, and then Spin Blur. Okay, so until recently, until CC came out, I'd be using Radial Blur. Now if you've ever used Radial Blur, you know it's a perfectly fine filter that's very, very difficult to use because you get no preview of how it's going to be applied. Spin Blur is a much better filter and it has a preview that's active on the screen. So I can drag the spin around, I can change the amount of spin, uh, and I can control it right here on screen. Now if you're going to use this, there's a good little tip I'm going to pass on. There are a bunch of little handles around the outside and on smaller versions of this, if you're not having a large spin, getting them and moving them can be tricky. So grab the great big white ones. These are the feathering options and drag them in towards the center. Okay, so that just feathers the, the spin down. But that means you can then go to the outer ones without running the risk of dragging the wrong thing because it's quite easy just to, to catch the wrong handle and give yourself a little bit of a, a problem. Um, and we're going to move them in there and I'm just going to spin this round and just make it look like the time is kind of spinning by uh, something like that. And I'm just going to position it just so we get a bit of movement like that. Okay, that looks pretty good. I could fiddle around with this all night, but I better not because we only have a certain amount of time. That's one of, the, that's one of the great things about Photoshop, isn't it? It's a wonderful way for time just to uh, disappear. I'll click OK and we'll apply the effect. Now, it works really quickly because it uses your graphics card to apply the preview. Then you have to wait a little bit for it to apply the real thing and it's normally quicker than that, but if you're trying to broadcast a live webinar, clearly it's a little bit slower. Now that's fine and the reason I, I, I did it on its own separate layer is because it spun the hands of the clock okay but it's also spun the words. 
So let's go back to the layer option and this time we're going to add in a layer mask and we'll put a reveal all layer mask in there and I'll just grab myself a little brush and we'll just paint back anything that shouldn't actually be blurry because we want some of those words to come through there we go. I mean, it would be a little bit blurred if the hands really were moving. They would blur the, the writing behind. Uh, but you get the idea. I could spend a lot longer and get that absolutely perfect. But for now, that's just fine. OK, let's just flatten down that image. We go to Layer and Flatten the Image. So the next thing to do is to make the clouds look like they're moving as well. Because if time was flying that fast, the clouds would have probably moved quite a long way. It, it might be a little bit surreal, this, but it'll work. Now, if I was just to make a copy of this and blur the, the, the background and cut things out, I'd blur the clouds, but I'd also blur the buildings, and it would look wrong. So I need to remove the buildings from the scene. Now, that means making a selection. Now, normally, I would jump into the Quick Selection tool and just start selecting away and you know, make a selection of the buildings or the sky. Um, but for time, because I'm a little bit short on time, I've already made my selection so let me just load this in. You don't need to sit and watch me make a fine selection. OK, so I've selected the buildings. I have pre-selected the, the clock. It's all selected. I'm going to use a little keyboard shortcut that's just a little bit of magic. Control-J or Command-J. It jumps the selection to a brand new layer. But not only does it jump it to a brand new layer, at the same time, it gets rid of the marching ants. Yep, it's a two for one. Who doesn't want a two for one on a keyboard shortcut? Yay. Anything that saves a bit of time is always good. Command J or Control J to jump your selection to a new layer. Right, so that's got our cutout OK, and you can see it's all nicely cut out. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to our selection, and I shall reselect it, uh, load it up again. And this time I'm going to expand the selection a little bit. So let's go to Select and modify and I'll expand it out however many 10 pixels that's fine that'll do and then I'm gonna fill this area which is the buildings and the clock with sky and to do it I'm gonna use edit and fill now on the fill I'll drop it down and find content aware Now, content aware is a, is a clever little bit of technology but there's been a little bit of an improvement in the last version there is now color adaptation if you see color adaptation, turn it on. It generally makes things work a little bit better. I'll click OK and I'll explain as it goes through. It, it works a little bit better. It tries to match both colors as well as the, the pixels around it. And I found through trial and error that more often than not, turning that on will give me a better finish than turning it off. It certainly hasn't, it doesn't need to make it any worse and definitely occasionally makes it better. So it's worth doing. Now, I know you're probably looking at that sky and thinking that's the least convincing sky I've seen in this webinar. I think that's a fair statement, actually. I can't argue with that. Yes, it is. It's a terrible sky, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to blur this sky. I just needed to get rid of the buildings so they didn't blur as well. The buildings are still there. They're on their own separate layer. Let's blur the sky. Let's give it some movement. Now, filter. Again, previously, before the blur gallery came along, I would do something like motion blur to give me some, some motion. Now, I use path blur. And path blur is basically the same as motion blur, except it's so much better. Let me explain. I can drag out my path like that, and I can change the angle, and I can change the speed on the right-hand side. There's a menu for the speed, or I could use control points and so on. So that gives me that basic movement. That gives it the look of time passing by. But here's where it starts to get a bit more creative. I can drag the middle point from that path and bend it. I can make Mother Nature do things that it doesn't want to do. I can bend the sky. I can click another point and add another bend as well. I can continually add points and change and distort the way that the sky bows and blends and, and get a picture that's just a little bit different than the ordinary. And that's what you're after. Let's click OK and render that up. Normally, when we're trying to shoot pictures, we, you know, we sometimes get the ordinary. The pictures that stand out are the extraordinary. Yep, unless there's a tornado passing over New York, I guess that cloud formation couldn't happen. But that doesn't necessarily matter because it's my picture and my interpretation of the world. Love that feature. So cool. OK, let's close that down. And we'll leave New York behind. And we're going to head over to Europe. 
So my next holiday of the year was to Amsterdam. We went to Amsterdam in May. Now we went there for, for a reason, probably not the reason you're thinking of. The reason we went to Amsterdam was my, my daughter just done a, her GCSE exams and they did the, the Anne Frank story. So she wanted to go along and, and have a look at the Anne Frank house and the places that she'd read about, uh, which we did. I've been once before. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous place to visit. I mean, the architecture, the art, it's, it's fantastic. What's not so fantastic is the weather, or at least when I went. Um, <laughs> It basically rained. We we, got, we went there for three days. The first night it was lovely, and then it rained continuously for the next three days. Yeah, you know, you can't book the weather when you go on holiday. So fortunately, I took a few pictures the first night I arrived. The view from my hotel window was the view of another hotel, pretty much eight inches in front of us. So nothing as far as the hotel view went this time. But this was just outside the hotel. We had this lovely set of canals and we had a, a terrific sky okay so a wonderful sunset now you're, you're probably watching this and thinking what sunset because my camera didn't capture it i mean it did if i if i take the highlight slider down here in raw th there is the merest hint of what was actually there we can do so much better than that and as a photographer i know what what i needed to do i knew this would happen this wasn't a surprise it wasn't a shock it was a known quantity of photography. I know that your digital SLR or your digital camera, whatever it might be, can't see what my eyes see. Just can't be done. So I took one, two, three pictures. So you'll see them there. Three very, very similar pictures. In fact, they're absolutely identical. The only difference is the exposure, which is three stops different on every shot. Why three stops? Well, that's what my Canon 60D will do. So I use it. So I'm going to bring those three images together using File, Automate, Merge to HDR Pro. Now, I just said the letters HDR. Please don't tune out. The HDR that you have in your head isn't the HDR that I'm going to do. Uh, what I do need to do is find the files for that. <laughs> it was going so smooth. Did I mention this is live? <laughs> there we go. That's where they are. Uh, and we'll click OK. So HDR, I've been doing HDR for a very, very long time, and it has radically changed in the last 12 months or so, completely. And, and when I say radically, to the point where you just can't tell them apart from my old shots, they are completely different. Okay, so what have I got here? Well, this is an HDR image, but I prefer to call it exposure blending, because that's what I'm going to do. If I said HDR and what you had in mind looked more like, let's do something awful, let's do Scott 5, that should be pretty, uh, yeah. Okay, if, if this is what you had in mind when I said HDR, the world has moved on. Now, I'm going to let you into a little secret. I like doing these. I, I really do, and I know I shouldn't, but I like doing them. What I don't do now is show anybody. <laughs> okay, so th these are my own little kind of fun. I think, oh yeah, that's kind of fun because it is fun, but it's not really photography as perhaps the purest sense. I don't do that anymore other than just for my own enjoyment. What I do is I now make 32-bit HDR files. Now, how am I going to do this? Well, a 32-bit HDR file can be opened in Adobe Camera Raw. But now there's a box right here that says complete toning in Adobe Camera Raw. So rather than having to jump through some hoops like I had to do before, now I can just tick that box and I can click on the button at the bottom that says tone in ACR. And it'll do a whole bunch of stuff automatically. It'll combine the images, it'll make a 32-bit file, and then it'll bring it into Camera Raw. So 32-bit file. We're getting a little bit geeky here. Um, I apologize for the geekiness, but a JPEG image is an 8-bit file. A RAW file is a 12, maybe 14-bit file. And we all know that RAW files have much more data than JPEGs. This is a 32-bit file. How much more data does this have than a RAW file? Tons. An unbelievable amount of extra data is in this picture. The only trouble is you have to go and get it out. But it's not a trouble, because here I am again inside of Adobe Camera Raw. 
Yep, it's the same raw that I use all of the time. I know this like the back of my hand. I can pull out data from this image. Let me show you how much I can pull out. I'm going to come to the exposure slider here. Now, normally, the exposure slider goes down to minus 5 and up to plus 5. With a 32-bit HDR, I can decrease my exposure, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, and I can keep going. 6, 7, 8, 9, I can go all the way down to minus 10. And I can go the other direction, all the way up to plus 10. I've got 20 stops of image data. I mean, just mind-blowing amount of data. And not like a raw file where you start to get right at the edges and it drops off a cliff for quality. This is gorgeous quality stuff. Now, what I can't do on Connect is show you a nice smooth graduation as I slide my slider down, because it doesn't work like that. But trust me, if you like doing AVs, slideshows, this is just a beautiful way to simulate a sunset inside of a slideshow. Okay, it, it just looks like the sun is setting or the sun is rising. It's incredible. It's so smooth. Every exposure you can imagine is right here. All I need to do is go and get it. So, for example, I can come and maybe just adjust the temperature a little bit, just to make it a little bit warmer. We can pull back the highlights and just tweak the exposure down a tiny bit and open up the shadows. And I'm not worried about maxing out these sliders too much uh, because I know I'm keeping good quality. Put a bit of contrast in there. Oh, ah, nearly, I nearly forgot clarity. <laughs> that was close. Uh, and of course, I can use all my, all my other tools as well. So I can go and get the, the graduated filter, dial in maybe a stop less light on the sky, and a bit more saturation. OK. Uh, maybe get the adjustment brush, and let's go add in a, a bit of extra lights on some of these buildings where they've gone a little bit dark. OK. And I can just go and play with this, and I could spend hours just tweaking, perfecting, and fine tuning. I don't have hours, sadly, but you get the idea. I can. I can work on this image and pull up plenty of information. And it really is gorgeous as well. If I zoom in, um, again, Connect won't give you the, the, the sheer quality that I can see on my screen. Trust me, I can make out every little flower, every little brick. Everything is pin sharp. Uh, there isn't any weirdness happening between the shadows and the highlights. Not even any chromatic aberration. But of course, I can go back and I can remove chromatic aberration if I really wanted to. I had to, but in this case, there isn't any. Absolutely fantastic. So if you've never tried this 32-bit Adobe Camera Raw processing for your HDR images, please give it a go. If you only take one take a technique away from this webinar, that one is beautiful. So photographically real, but so amazing to work with. It's the future of photography. It really is. OK, I think I've waxed lyrical a bit too much about that one. Let's close that down. Right, so uh, one more from, from Amsterdam. So as I said, the, the weather, weather was awful. I mean, <laughs> it rained, and it was like London, really, just, just in Amsterdam. It was horrible weather. So what do you do when you're on a family holiday and it rains? Yeah, what you do is you go and play glow-in-the-dark crazy golf. It's amazing. So my daughter, bless her, she, she you know, researched places to go and, and visit during our wet weekend in Amsterdam. Uh, glow in the dark, crazy golf. It was hard to find. I mean, we, we had to really look for it. We found it underneath a pub, and uh, we were the only ones down there. It's a hole, 15 holes of glow in the dark, crazy golf. Yep. <laughs> Why 15? Why 15? Why not 18? Because it's Amsterdam, and that's kind of, I guess, the way it is over there. The place is completely black, only lit by UV lights, and everything's painted with fluorescent glow-in-the-dark paint, including the golf balls. That red streak in the bottom corner is actually a golf ball. It was a longish exposure. Even the golf clubs glow in the dark. Now, this isn't a picture that I want to do anything particularly with, but it's a picture I would like to share with my friends and family. This is the sort of holiday snap that, as photographers, we don't take enough of. OK, maybe that's just me. But we don't. We, we often get so wrapped up in the serious bit of photography, we forget to do the family stuff, the, the more informal pictures. So how can I share this image directly from Photoshop? Well, there's a couple of ways. Uh, one way is to go to File. Well, I can share it on Behance. OK, so let's just launch that, because it takes a second to connect. It takes even longer when your internet connection is being doubled up for live streaming. Uh, but uh, give it a second. So if you've not looked at Behance before, just 
go have a look at it. I mean, just Google it, go there, have a look at it, because it is stuffed, jam-packed with awesome content for creative media people, photographers, videographers, graphics designers. That's the kind of place you put your work to be noticed in that world. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not sure I want to be noticed for this picture. This is a family picture. It's probably not one I want to share with the creative community. So in this case, I don't want to share it on behalf, but I, I could. I could if I wanted to. What I want to do is I want to share it with my friends in a way that they can download if they wish, or they can view online if they wish. I'm not going to force them to do either or. And to do that, I'm going to share it on my creative cloud storage. So I'm going to go up to File, Save As, and on my Save As option, I'll find the Creative Cloud Files, because it stores them locally on your hard drive and then syncs it with your Creative Cloud when you're online. Uh, let's call this, uh, hang on a second, it's going to go a bit quiet, Glow Golf, there we go, and click on this Save button. I'll save it as a JPEG, but I could also have saved this as a PSD file if I wanted to. If I'd, if it was the, the one of the clock and the clouds, for example, I could have kept all those layers intact and shared it as a PSD file. Now, having saved it in my Creative Cloud, it now syncs automatically up onto the internet. It still exists on my hard drive, but if I go into my Creative Cloud uh, options, it's, here we go, and we'll go and have a look at my assets and my files, my view on the web, and let's see if this has worked, because doing this as I'm live streaming could be, no, of course it worked. Why was I worrying? I was, I shouldn't have doubted Adobe for a second. It works beautifully. There it is, Glow Golf. It shared it for me. So it now exists on the internet and on my hard drive as well. So how can I share this with people? Well, there's a little down arrow here, and I could post it to Behance from here, look at that. Or I can share the link, so we'll click on that. Now, if you want to make a link to share with people, you click on the Create Public Link. Uh, it's not a great description because it's not public. It's only public for those that have the link. Okay, so it's not going to be found on, on Google Images, for example. You can type in the email address of the person or people you want to send it to and send them the link. You can even come down here and allow them to download the file or allow them not to download the file. Uh, so again, if it's a, a, P a PSD file, they will see the completed version even if they don't have Photoshop installed on their computer. So it's a nice, easy way to share things without committing someone to uh, having a, a great big file landing in their, their, their inbox and without the requirements of a Photoshop or some sort of viewer. Okay, let's close that down and we'll leave Amsterdam behind. So where are we going to go next? Well, next we're going to come back to the UK and we're going to go for my weekend breakaway. So my daughter had a prom this year, a leaving the school prom, and everybody goes to the prom in some vehicle or another, everything from, I don't know, pogo sticks and segways to double-decker buses and stretch limos. We hired a camper van. <laughs> Great fun. And we decorated it out. But we had to hire the camper van for a week. So what do you do with it? Well, you go camping, don't you? Now, let me explain my ethos on holidays. I like to go on holidays to places that are better than where I live normally. That's my idea of a good holiday, going up in the world. Camping isn't my idea of going up in the world. That's my idea of going down in the world. But hey, we hired this thing, we're going to use it. Let's just say it was interesting, but I won't be repeating the experience. I think that kind of sums it up, really. So what I, I did do is take a few pictures. So let's start with this one. This is a panorama, a sequence of overlapping pictures. You can possibly see the front of the camper van, and then you can see it all. So you can see they, they overlap. To join these individual pictures together, I'm going to go to File. I'm going to go to Automate, and down to Photo Merge. Now, Photo Merge is the bit of software that allows me to combine things together Really easy if you've never used it before. Cylindrical is the choice. If your feet don't move, cylindrical is the panorama that you've shot. I'll add in the open files, and I'll click OK, and off it goes. So it'll start to do some, bring the files together. It'll start to look for the overlaps and the joins, and then it'll kind of put everything in place. And it always takes longer when you're waiting for it, but it'll get there in a second. There, there we go. So there it is, there is my panorama. And as you can see, I've got some little issues because I've got some gaps top and bottom. I did this handheld, so no tripod involved. Let's just merge the layers down. 
Now, to fill in those gaps, I suppose I could crop the picture, but I like the format, so I'm going to try and fill them in. And I'll fill them in by using the Magic Wand tool. We'll click into the checkerboard pattern, and then I'll fill them in using something we've used before. Let's go to Edit, Fill, and Content Aware. Now, once again, I'm going to use the Color Adaption, and I'll click OK. And I'll explain why as it runs through. So the color adaption works really well where you have a graduated image in your, your shot. So in this case, for example, the sky where it blended from light on one side to darker at the top. It copes really well with those areas. So sometimes you find the traditional content aware didn't do skies so well. Now it seems just absolutely uh, to do skies beautifully. What about removing Sam from the picture? Sorry, Sam, if you're listening. Uh, it, it's nothing personal. Uh, I'm just going to take you out of the shot. Now, to take somebody out of a picture, my go-to tool of choice is the Spot Healing Brush. So I'm just going to paint over my wife. And we'll just go around like that. Uh -huh, and there we go. And we'll let it analyze the picture. And it does a fairly good job at removing Sam from the shot. Yeah, pretty good. What if it doesn't work though? Let, let's let's come out of that and let's go and find a picture that we shot on our travels that it doesn't work. So just down the road is Brighton. Where better to take a camper van? On this shot, I want to remove some of the distractions. Uh, I've got a uh, a box down here and some people, and I want to get rid of some of them, not necessarily all of them, but some of them. So normally I would grab my sort of spot healing brush and kind of paint over something like that and cross my fingers and hope that it disappears. And it mostly disappeared. Mostly is not quite what I'm after. And even sometimes it'll leave a kind of a trace behind. So if you're looking for another way to remove something, have a little look at the patch tool. Now the patch tool is really simple but really effective. All you have to do is draw. And if you can draw a basic selection, you can use the patch tool. Then you drag your selection over to wherever you would like your, uh, your patch to go. And you can line things up and try and match up textures and, and shapes. And it'll patch it up. Now, it works quite well as it stands. Uh, I'll explain about some of the newer features in just a second. But the reason I like it is I can go and draw over lots of bits and patch them all at once. Okay, so really quick and simple. It often comes unstuck where you have changes in color and texture. Okay, so if I paint over this lady here and I come and drag it across, what I can see on my screen, and you probably can't on yours because you know, the compression, but I can see a slight purple mist where she was and, and the waves don't seem quite to match up anymore. Something odd has happened. Well, now I can come to the color and structure options and it's usually the color I need to adjust. And I can tweak my color, and I can get Photoshop to rethink what it's just done and do a better job. And I can select anything between 1 and 10 on this slider, and I just kind of work my way up and, and, and find one that works well. And I think number 3 looked about right. And then I can just go and draw around the next people, like this, and round we go. Uh, and this one is a little bit harder. You can see that there's quite a difference in color between my sample point and where I want it to go. But once again, with the color selected, I can actually fine tune the color and get that just to, to come back through and it really does work. Sometimes you have to do structure as well, it depends on the, the shot, so you need to be prepared to, to fine tune things. Uh, and I can come in here and, and do that one. Maybe we'll just try a little bit of structure in there, Ooh, not that much, just a little tiny bit, like so. Okay. And I can tidy up the beach in just a few seconds. And if you're thinking I added the birds in, you're wrong, they were actually there. Which is unusual, because normally I do add the birds in. <laughs> but they were actually there. So the patch tool really has come on a long way. And now uh, I find it to be an extremely powerful tool for getting great results. OK, so time is ticking on. I'm uh, keeping a close eye on the time. Uh, we, how are we doing? We've got a couple more to go through. Let's grab this shot here. Now, I like to work in RAW wherever I can. And one of my complaints about RAW has always been the lack of good cloning inside of RAW. Uh, and that's often why I needed Photoshop, for things like the patching that I've just done there. Because RAW is not, not that good at cloning until now. Now it is. Now it can do it. So let's go grab ourselves the Spot Healing Brush. The Spot Healing Brush, normally, when you click, 
it'll put a circle and that's all you used to get a circle which made it quite frustrating to use I'm gonna give you a little secret tip okay it's not really a secret but a little tip sometimes you'll find that its sample point is the least logical place that you would have thought of because it automatically guesses where to sample from if you press the backslash key backslash key that's the one on my keyboard on Windows that's underneath the question mark it's over on the right hand side if you press that it'll jump the sample point around and it'll sample in random other places and sometimes that's all you need to do to get it to do what you want okay so the backslash key will randomly jump your sample point around okay that that's fine um, but um, what I want to do is I want to remove this entire section well now what I can do is I can click and draw in a straight line or a wonky line or any pattern I like and it'll automatically do a large area yep no more single points now I can do a great big area and I can drag that around and say actually I want the, uh, the bit from over there just so we don't get a repeating pattern and it's done <laughs> it's just, just the little things that make a difference that makes a big difference that's fantastic okay so last picture we're gonna do during this webinar and um, we're almost out of time so we'll come on to some questions in just a minute but I'm gonna finish with this shot here it's kind of a, an end of the day shot and I felt it was a good one to finish on uh, again taken down on the the south coast uh, this was actually on my main holiday and my main holiday was, was just lovely we just sat on the beach and I didn't do a great deal of photography because I was relaxing and isn't that the main thing of holidays yeah of course it is that and photography so we're going to bring a couple of the things I've shown you together in this shot because what I wanted to do was have a picture of this flag and I wanted the flag to be moving waving in the breeze I deliberately put the Sun in the picture I stopped my aperture down to f22 to get that natural starburst effect that's what happens if you really stop it down trouble is when you shoot into the Sun your shutter speed even at f22 is fast enough to freeze a slightly moving flag add to that you also get a ton of lens flare <laughs> so we got a couple of things to fix for the lens flare I'm gonna fix them using the healing brush so I'm just not with the healing brush I'm with the patch tool did I mention this is alive? <laughs> we'll use the patch tool and I'll just loosely draw around there like so. That makes a loose selection and now I can just come and drag this over to the side. You can see the colors don't really match but when I let go the patch tool will use its structure and color techniques to match everything in. If it's not right of course I can just come and move for example the color maybe a little bit different and just a small adjustment is enough to tweak the end result okay I'm happy with that that's fine we've got a couple of areas we can do here let's do that little spot and we'll do this little spot here okay so we'll just patch those up really nicely so that's got rid of the lens flare what about the moving flag well for the moving flag I'm going to do the the blur tools that I used before so let's go back to filter blur gallery and I'm going to use path blur now of course you could do this with liquify or many of the other tools but this is a lovely way to work if you've got access to the new tools working with new techniques is what it's all about make use of them so the path blur allows me to draw a, a line which is great and I can change the speed of course but it also allows me to bend and twist so I can come and add some movement to my flag as I try to click and drag in here there's no magic to this I haven't got a master plan I'm just looking at the end result and thinking yeah I kind of like that now you don't have to have just one path you can have as many paths as you want so maybe we'll come and add a, another one through here and we'll change the, the shape a little bit and we'll put a little bit more kind of blurring in here yeah that looks pretty good so it really looks like it's it's blowing in the breeze now I've managed to make my flag look like it's moving but what I've also managed to do is make the flagpole look like it basically I've blurred everything is what I've done it wasn't quite the plan okay so what I'm gonna do is we'll move that out of the way I'm gonna add a new path that just goes down through the flagpole and on that path I'm gonna click on the end point okay so it's kinda of small but I've just clicked one right at the top of the pole I'm gonna come over to the right hand side where it says end point speed and I'm just gonna drag my end point speed all the way down to zero and then I'm gonna click on the other end point and do exactly the same endpoint speed down to zero and that sharpens up the pole effectively we said this area of the picture I don't want you to blur it's like masking it off 
but did you notice I didn't do any layers at all. So all I need to do then is just hit the OK button and that will apply the change once again it, it applies it, it renders it um, a little bit afterwards when you click it, it doesn't take long though maybe just crop that in and that was the shot that I had in my head but I wasn't able to capture in the camera for purely technical reasons. So there we go, there is a whistle stop tour around just a few of my holiday pictures, sadly we didn't get time for everything but isn't that always the way uh, and besides the year's not over yet um, I haven't got any more holidays planned but um, hopefully one day uh, before the end of the year I, I may get away again you never never know so let's just jump out of this and we'll jump into the uh, little screen here hopefully your screen should change any second now so if you've got any questions about what you've just seen then please, there's a, a questions pod right in the middle of the screen, do pop the, uh, the questions in there and I will try and answer any that I can. I'll just pause for breath and take a, a glass of water. Thank you very much for everybody that, that's thanking me and has managed to stay there at the end. I really appreciate that. It's good to see. The, the odd thing is when I'm doing these webinars, I can't see how many people are with me as I'm doing them. So it's not until now that I can really see if there's anybody still there. And there is. So thank you very, very much, everybody that's, uh, that's managed to make it to the end. Okay, so uh, Steve W, how do we view this on recap? Um, well, it should have been recording. I'm hoping it's recording. Otherwise, I'll have to say this all over again. It was recording earlier. So there, there will be a recording coming out soon. Uh, guess, can I come and live with you for a week? <laughs> Depends where you live. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to work on that one. Uh, Richard, really good question. So Richard Huggins, why do I use Camera Raw in preference to Lightroom? I, uh, Richard, I use both. If, I've, if I'm doing my professional work and I've got hundreds of pictures I need to edit really quickly, Lightroom is my tool of choice. If I've got one picture and I just want to bring it in and do a quick bit of adjusting, I, I don't necessarily want to put it into my library and uh, I find that doesn't necessarily always fit in with my workflow. So if I've got one image I want to bring in, I'll just do it inside of Photoshop. If I've got hundreds, I'll use Lightroom. Uh, Ken, how many of the tools are inside of CS6? Uh, some of them. Uh, some of them are new inside of CC. Some of them are new. If you have a little look at the, the Adobe website, you can find what's new. There's a nice little area on um, new features so you can see what you're missing. Uh, and of course, you can always try CC, uh, try the trial version, um, or sign up for the, the Creative Cloud Photography thing. It's, it's uh, pretty good value. Uh, Dave C, with all the improvements in ACR, do you use uh, Lightroom uh, uh, if you did before? Uh, yes, uh, all of the improvements in Adobe Camera Raw, most of them are also in Lightroom as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a very symbiotic relationship for me. Uh, Andy, uh, yeah, watch the recording and I can go through it again. Uh, Buck, so uh, how did I do uh, select the complex selections in New York? Uh, uh, well, Buck, they, were, they really weren't complex selections. Actually, uh, buildings are nice and easy to select. The, it just takes a bit of time. So my go-to selection tool, and I know my, my screen is kind of small, but uh, um, <laughs> I, I try and make it a little uh, clear as I can. I use the quick selection tool as my go-to tool of choice, and that's surprisingly good. One little tip I can give you, Buck, is rather than trying to select the buildings, try and select the sky. That's much, much easier to get than all of the complicated textures that make up a building. So if you select the sky and then invert it, that does the same thing, and often that's a quicker and simpler way to work. Uh, okay, so ooh, they're, they're building up quite quick. So, uh, Kate, uh, do I always flatten images uh, after editing? Um, so, Kate, I, I don't normally flatten images unless I'm very, very confident that I, I, that I need to. Uh, sometimes I will save as PSD files as I go along. If I am saving and I know I've absolutely finished, I'll save it as a JPEG, but I'll often still have my PSD files. The exception to that, of course, is RAW. I do an awful lot of my work inside of RAW, and in those circumstances, it remembers all my edits, so I don't have to worry about flattening at all. Uh, 
Uh, so Sham, what software do I recommend for quick skin softening? My, um, it's not part of tonight's webinar because uh, other than my wife and daughter, I didn't photograph anybody on my holidays. Uh, for skin softening though, my, my quick tip is clarity. If you, if you want to soften skin quickly, just uh, put the clarity into the negative uh, area. Uh, use the adjustment brush and paint negative clarity onto parts of the picture or positive clarity into areas. So if you want to do it quick and simply, um, Adobe Camera Raw can, can do you a, a very quick skin edit. Uh, Debbie, so for a beginner, which software would you recommend? Debbie, that's a little bit of a uh, how long is a piece of string question. Um, th there isn't a right piece of software or a wrong piece of software because it depends what you want to do with the software. Uh, if you're a beginner in photography, then Lightroom is a nice straightforward editing process. There's, there's, it doesn't have all the complications of, say, Photoshop. Um, if you want to do some of the things in Photoshop, then Lightroom and Photoshop Elements are a brilliant combination. Those two work together really well. Um, but for the, the price of the, the photography bundle, £8.50 a month here in the UK, then Photoshop and Lightroom is an absolute bargain. Uh, Simon, is there any tips for altering uh, colors to be more pastely or dreamy? Yep, Simon, I can give you a really, really quick tip on that. Um, let's bring in a picture that's bright and colorful, and let's jump into Camera Raw. And again, I apologize, it's a really small screen, um, but it's the only way I can get all this to work on screen together. Uh, the Vibrance slider. If you want that pastely, dreamy color, take the vibrant slider down into its neutral tones, into negative territory. It'll take away the really, really strong colors uh, and leave you with some nice, soft, pastely tones. Probably not a good picture to demonstrate it on, but trust me, the vibrant slider in negative will give you uh, a pretty good idea of, of what you want to go for and, and hopefully get you where you want to be. Uh, camera questions, uh, Canon 60D or the new 7D, wow. Um, honestly, go to your nearest camera store. If you, if you want to know which camera should you buy, go down to your nearest camera store if you can find one and try them for yourself. They are very, very personal things and um, yeah, you need to pick one up and try one. Uh, Angela, yep, there should be a recording coming soon. Uh, it's a long way down to uh, Australia, so um, yeah, I haven't got a piece of string that could get all the way there, so apologies if we're having little cutouts. Uh, Ian, is there any need to do more than three shots in HDR? Yes, Ian, the more pictures you can do, the better. The more smoother your HDR transitions will be, uh, the more you can use the full extent of the 32-bit file. Yep. Honestly, you can't have too many. And besides, what's going to happen in the future? We're at 32-bit now. Maybe in the future we'll go 64-bit, and we, we'll all be looking at our three pictures and thinking, oh, why didn't I take six? So, Ian, yep, more the better. Uh, Magda2, can I explain the bit about changing JPEGs to RAWs? Uh, very, very quickly, because I'm short of time. Yep, if you have Photoshop CC, all you do is you go to the filter menu and you choose camera raw filter. Other than that, you might want to have a look at bridge as an alternative way. Um, but nowadays, filter, camera raw filter, any layer, any image will go from your layer or from your, your, your Photoshop into raw. Just, just amazing. Okay, so let's just do one more question. Uh, uh, okay, and uh, I apologize. I'm not going to get to everybody's question. I, I, I am so sorry, but um, we are literally out of time. So let's just come down and I'll take my next one, which is Brian's. Um, uh, why did you add pixels to your New York selection? Uh, brilliant question, Brian. When I did the New York selection, let's go find it, um, do, 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 which is up here with that one. Um, if I'd have just loaded my selection in and uh, then I'd have tried to fill it, what would happen if I zoom in really, really, really close is sometimes when you make a selection it's just the wrong side 
of the edge of your, your thing you've selected. So in this case, I increase the selection by a couple of pixels just to guarantee that there wouldn't be a faint outline of the buildings left behind. Because when I blurred them, that faint, faint outline would then stretch across the picture and rather ruin the effect that I was going for. Some may say that would have improved it um, by making it uh, less obvious. But um, that, for me, was, was the reason why it would have uh, possibly have given an outline that I didn't want. OK, so there we go. That brings us right round to the, the top of the hour again, 8 o'clock in the evening here in the UK. That, I'm afraid, is the end of my webinar. I, I really, really want to thank everybody for coming along and, uh, and being part of this. It, it's been absolutely great fun. It, it's fantastic to see so many people here. And hopefully, what I've managed to do is to give you all a little bit of, uh, of help, advice, and a few ideas of things you could do with your photography. Uh, that's really my main goal, is to get everybody out there taking more pictures, using Photoshop to make great pictures, and then sharing them with the world, either via Behance or on their Creative Cloud page. And if I've done even a little bit of that tonight, then it is worth spending an hour with me. So thank you very much for Adobe for making this possible. I'd like to wish you all a very good evening. I'm Gavin Hoey. Thanks for watching. <laughs>